everyone. Um, my name is Aunt Dr. Andrea Douglas, and I'm the Executive Director here at the Jefferson School African American Heritage Center. I'd like to thank you all very much for joining us tonight. If you're wondering who is sitting here with me, this is Nazir. He would not sit elsewhere, so he's going to join us for the conversation tonight. Um, we're here uh, for the 2023 Evelyn Barber Lectures. And this year, we're tackling something that I think is on all of our minds. It is this notion of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and I have with me someone who I'm looking forward to speaking with about this, um, Matthew Reynolds. But before I go forward, let me just tell you a little bit about Evelyn Barber, especially if this is the first time that you've joined us for this lecture series. The lecture series is named after um, Mrs. Evelyn Barber, and some of us in the community knew Evelyn as Miss Evelyn. And for me, she was a guiding light. She was one of the first members of the advisory committee for the Jefferson School African American Heritage Center. And when she passed in 2014, she was 78 years of age. She um, had attended the Jefferson School um, and was among the first graduating class at Jackson P. Burley High School. She was an alumnus of Virginia Union and the University of Virginia School of Education. And she's taught in various school systems and retired after more than 30 years of service. She was a lifelong member of Mount Zion First African Baptist Church, and her most notable work in the church was her role as historian. And I can say that was her most notable role, one of her notable roles in our community. She really held the community history. And for me, helped me understand how important the history of Charlottesville was, and ultimately even how important this conversation is that we're about to have tonight as I think back about it. And as I said, our series for 2023 tackles the subject that is a consequence of a push for organizations to create cultural and cultural environments that promote safety for everyone. It began as a good thing and has been co-opted, some would argue, and transformed by the systems that were created long ago in opposition to this goal. So, as I said, we're talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And having um, Matthew here with us is uh, our first uh, foray into this discussion. Matthew has lived in a variety of communities, countries, and demographics. He has thoroughly honed his communication skills and paired them with an innate curious generosity toward the perspective of others. With over 15 years as a teacher in secondary education, He's passionate about disseminating knowledge. A focus on the performing arts has tuned his ability to reach minds and change hearts through multiple avenues of learning and processing. He was named um, top five finalist for Oregon Teacher of the Year in 2018 and received 
an honorable mention for the Excellence in Theater Education Award presented by the Tony Awards and Carnegie, excuse me, Carnegie Mellon University. He was voted Teacher of the Year at Crater Renaissance Academy in 2009 and was awarded Volunteer and Educator of the Year from Southern Oregon Queer Resource Center, SOU, in 2006. Matthew Reynolds has over 35 years of experience as a performer and instructor in the theater arts and dance. And he helped create the um, Renaissance Academy of Arts and Sciences in Southern Oregon right out of his Masters of Teaching program. So Matthew, let me say welcome. Mm -hmm. And I want us to first start by talking about, I read your bio, lots of discussion about teaching. How did we go from teaching to where you are now and, and working and thinking about this space of diversity, equity, and inclusion? Well, Dr. Douglas, thank you so very much um, for having me here. Um, thanks, Evelyn, Miss Evelyn, for everything that she contributed to the Charlottesville community. Um, and it is truly an honor to be here and to have this open discussion, this honest discussion, and hopefully um, as people listen, that they'll have a stronger understanding of they themselves, where they're coming from, when they hear these, these letters, E-D-I, D-E-I, J-E-D-I, I-D-E-A, um, be used in our, our culture, be used um, at their workplace, in their school, in their classrooms, um, and that they'll be able to truthfully and honestly feel and understand where people within the within the situation that they're in are coming from. Is it a place of performative? Is it a place of um, really trying to enact some type of change? And so for me, my journey is being a multimedia performance artist, um, being really cathartic about being an openly gay black man, um, what that meant growing up in predominantly white uh, communities uh, in North Central Minnesota, going to the University of Minnesota, what all of that meant, finally finding my way into education in 2005, um, getting my master's in teaching and then teaching in a predominantly white community in Southern Oregon. And how, as I was growing my, my classroom, growing myself and looking at the classroom, I realized that I wanted to base my, my philosophy of education on community. And basically what I didn't feel, what I didn't have when I was you know, my student's age going to high school and how I felt a lot of times on the outside, did all these things, was in NHS and student council, top band, top choir, did the spring musical, football swimming track, blah, 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 la, 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 all these things to try to be the, to be the ideal that um, people wouldn't be calling me the names that they were calling me or saying the things about myself or my family that they were saying, et cetera, et cetera, trying to um, fit in and not necessarily belong. So as I started to hone that in my classroom, um, I started to see that more and more in the world around. I also started to see that in the bureaucracy that is public education in our nation and how that system was put into play to truly separate folks and say, you're part of labor, you're part of academia, this is your lot in life, fixed mindset, now go and do what you're doing, believe the status quo when it tells you certain things, don't look at the man behind the curtain and just go live your life and everything will be fine. And that had nothing to do with authenticity, that had nothing to do with the truth of my lived experience and who I was. And so I wanted to give that to my students. And then as the years progressed and um, 45 got elected, the people who did not want me in this predominantly white community um, that were there all along got louder and more vocal. Um, and then after I had a continuous nightmare about an active shooter, shooting all my former students, shooting my current students, turning the gun on me, no more bullets, drops the gun, walks away. After the third time I had that nightmare, I wrote my letter of resignation and no longer was in the, in the education system. But I wasn't done. There were things that I'd learned from all of that. The past is our education is a strong motto of mine. I really look at that. And as I was looking at that more and more, I was like, well, what can I do? How can I, now that I'm not in that system, how can I change that system a little bit more? 
How can I adjust it? How can I, oh, wait, let me look at this a little closer. How can I create a new system that has nothing to do with the current system and how it runs and how it functions based on white supremacy culture? I want to build something else. And that got me finding myself asking the question, hey, Matthew, how much of your thinking is your thinking? How much of my thinking truly is my thinking? Which helped me to go and look at people like the, the People's Institute for Survival and Beyond and doing work with people who have been doing DEI work for over 40 years. And with these elders, I was like, wow, you've been doing this for over 40 years. And then I was like, wait a second, why have you been doing this for over 40 years? And then really starting to look at the history of it and wondering why things weren't shifting and changing. And one of the things that I was stating right before we got on is this idea that supremacy culture does this thing with time and it starts pushing through media, pop culture, propaganda, other ways to get time to, to stretch out so that you're working really hard kind of thing. When it, what it's doing on the behind the scenes is that noise on my end or is that noise on your end as far as I think it's my end it's the it's the um hvac coming on oh, yeah. beautiful <laughs> once uh, i know what it is there's been a lot of energy around these days and i'm like mm, I'm, gonna I'm, gonna, I'm gonna sit and listen for a second right but what what supremacy culture does is it stretches out that time keeps us looking everywhere but except at itself, and then it slowly permeates its way into whatever it is, co-ops it for its own, and then says, oh, we don't know what's going on here. Everything's fine. Just keep doing the way that you've been doing things. And what we're doing is we're continually upholding supremacy culture. And we, we, we don't have an opportunity, the greater we of humanity, the greater we of Black America, we don't get an opportunity to dissect it even more and say, wait, no, this is still supremacy culture and I want to build something new. So that's how I kind of got my way into looking at the world of DEI and really getting an understanding for myself of what it meant to me. And now I'm working in it in a capacity of um, my clubhouse room is called Liberated DEI. Um, so it's this idea of going beyond DEI and it's not to poo-poo the practitioners of it because there's a lot of folks that are doing a lot of good work and it's a hard slog, but I don't think we need to be working as hard as we are if we turn our focus more onto building something new. Why are we expecting corporate America? Why are we expecting these places to all of a sudden eradicate racism and all of a sudden get rid of these things for us? They don't want to, it's where their power lies. It's where a lot of the money that they're making lies. They don't want to get rid of that. So why not say, I don't subscribe to that ideology. I'm going to build something new. You with me? Who's with me? Let's go build something new. You said a lot of things, so we're going to take a little time to unpack it. And so we're going to, I'm going to, I want to start sort of at the very basic level here, right? Um, in your understanding of diversity and equity, can you give us your um, definition of diversity and equity? How, what does that say, sound like for you? I feel that for my definition of diversity is diversity of lived experience. I feel that we as individuals have lived a life that is so varied and individualistic to who we are as an individual that true diversity starts there. Society sees diversity defined in these um, uh, physical attributes. And now we've added into it accessibility and disabilities, and we've added into it the idea of mental health as well. So diversity then takes on these categories and these boxes. Equity, to me, means humanity-led, which means that I see somebody's humanity first and foremost. I don't see productivity. I don't see quantitative and qualitative information. I'm doing my best not to look with implicit bias. I'm doing my best to make sure that I'm looking with my own personal equity lens, my own lens of humanity first and foremost. Equity to others, I think they believe that it means 
um, this idea of that you, we got to make sure that everybody's getting the same amount of pay, the same amount of money, that people need to look at affirmative action and make sure that we're doing that. People need to um, uh, have the same amount of bathrooms or this kind of thing or et cetera, et cetera. And that it doesn't necessarily have within it humanity as one of those aspects of equity. Okay. So it sounds like that you believe that there is a distance between the ways in which you're defining it and the ways in which other people define it. Yes. Um, right. And that makes sense, of course, because you're here to teach, right? So as you go out into, into the spaces that you go into and the corporate world, let's say, because that's essentially what you do. You talk to other organizations about this this topic. What do you feel are the mistakes? And, and, and I don't say mistakes, meaning they're doing something wrong, but within the context of how you're defining it, where do you see the disconnect between what people think about it and where you'd like people to, to, to engage? Excellent. Beautiful question. I feel that a lot of organizations are looking for somebody to come in and tell them what to do. Tell me what to do. And it, and for some, it comes from a heartfelt place. From others, it's like, I don't have time. This is too much. I don't need another thing. We got to keep our productivity going. We got to keep making money. We got to keep these things moving. You guys over there, EDI team, you take care of it. When I come in and I talk to people before, because my my consultations are an hour long and it's not, are they going to hire me? I'm looking, am I going to work with you? Because what it comes down to when I'm looking at this aspect of working with an organization, I'm looking for them to understand that if you want me to come in and write your policies and procedures, if you want me to write your mission statement, rewrite certain things, I can do all that for you but that's not where it's at. I'm here to shift the culture. I'm here to get us out from underneath the idea of white supremacy culture. So what we're gonna start with is really intimate work. We're gonna have people craft their equity lens for themselves, not for the organization, because your organization, no matter what metrics you're looking at, et cetera, et cetera, there are people behind those numbers. And so we're gonna start with those people if we really want the culture to shift. And that's when people either go, yes, I've never heard this approach before. Let's talk about it some more. Let's move forward with this. Or people are like, uh, yeah, no, we're looking for somebody so that we can keep our money going and you're not it. So you're not going to tell us what to do so you can go away. And that's where the difference happens. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so how does one then begin to move people into the direction? What are the things that you're tending to to find um, when you're when you're in these rooms, what are the what are the you know it's money is a concern, but when you start to reach that place of the approach that you're talking about, the the, the people centered approach, what are the main concerns as you're engaging in, in that kind of conversation? What are people saying to to you about even their own understanding of why they're in the room? and wanting to engage in that kind of way? Humanity. I think a lot of folks don't feel seen, don't feel heard. I feel that, you know, um, Dr. Brene Brown, like her or not, she did a big thing for society. She did a big thing for socialization by bringing such words as vulnerability to the surface um, in the magnitude that she, as a white-bodied woman, could do. And it's brought a lot of light onto these ideas of, oh, looking at emotional intelligence, looking at these ideas of that I need some healing, that there is some healing within myself that needs to happen. There's a shift in consciousness that needs to go on. It's not just my thinking that needs to change, right? It's my mind, body, and my spirit that needs to be shifted and moved to a different frequency, one that is truthful to my authenticity and isn't upholding the status quo's idea. So a lot of people have no idea what that means to them individually. They know through the first day of our workshop that things are stirring up, that things are coming up for them, 
that it isn't all just here in the head. I can't think my way through this. I can't allow perfectionism or a right to comfort or any other characteristic of whiteness to be in the room with me. And I'm starting to see the connectedness of how that is dictating my thinking. Once again, how much of your thinking is your thinking? And I think that for a lot of folks, by me setting up and my co-facilitator facilitators setting up rooms that aren't led by shame, aren't led by guilt, that are there letting everybody know that we're all going to put our foot in it. We're going to put our foot in our mouth. We're going to say something wrong for someone, but that's not a reason to shut down the conversation. Then we're allowed and given ourselves grace and giving others grace to step into that discomfort and to be able to hopefully, hopefully by the end of a period of time of working with us, that we start to embrace that part that humanity is more than just being happy all the time, is more than these ideas that everything is supposed to be comfortable. We've driven that home so much that this multifacetedness of emotions that we as human beings have aren't even being utilized anymore because of the fixed mindset. This is my lot in life, oh, ho, hum, woe is me. Or, oh, I've got all these things, Where's this? You owe me this. I should be get, given these things. We are so more than that binary thinking. And so when are we going to allow ourselves to truly be more than just a binary thought? So this is this is an interesting thing because I want to just delve into a little bit more about, because you've, you've used the term white supremacist culture. So explain that for us. When you're talking about that, what are you talking? How, are, how, are, how does that look in your mind? Okay, so I'm, I'm thinking through how far, because as you can tell, I talk. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes I'll get lost on that conversation. <laughs> kind of thing. Um, so Ibram X. Kendi talked about Gomez de Zarara, and that was the first written racist mindset or thought process that he could find how he, Gomez de Zarara, wrote for the Portuguese king who had just basically created the Atlantic slave trade, was the first to go to Sub-Saharan Africa, grab people for labor and sell them, right? But he now had this writing that said that the whole continent of Africa, this vast continent of people, were all beastly, right? And they were inferior. And so that was the first time that we see these writings, racist, race-based writings that said that there is a, a, a supreme or a group that's above another group of people. And that's why it's okay to treat them the way that we are. So we start rolling forward. This, this is the 1450s, right? We start rolling forward to colonization that was all about, we've got these weapons that can kill so many more of you more quickly. We have diseases that you've never heard of that can kill so many of you quickly. Look, we can kill you all so we can take your land or take your resources or both, or we can enslave you and make you our colony and you'll do things for us. And aren't we great in this mindset? And that is supremacy culture. White and the construct of white and whiteness was created in 1681, right, after the Bacon Rebellion. And it's the first time that we see the word white used in Jamestown, um, Virginia, and the colonies there. And it's used in a way that all of a sudden now all of Western Europe, physical attributes, et cetera, are starting to come into, the, into play even more so. And so then there, these constructs, these, these lies were created and therefore have been if you lie, what you got to do, you got to keep lying to uphold that lie. And so it's been happening for hundreds of years now that this just keeps getting upheld and upheld. And in greater conversations, longer conversations with me, you'll hear me use white supremacy culture and you'll hear me use supremacy culture because I think that that idea has been permeated into our socialization that your melanation, it doesn't matter. There's still this idea of supremacy culture that I need to have, I need to have someone lesser than me for me to consider myself successful or worthy. And that mindset is based on a lie and I don't subscribe to that ideology. So that's my thoughts around it. Okay, which 
I think that's, I mean, I think that's even a very, that, that point, again, we need to sort of unpack that a little bit too, because what, what that in, seems to sort of infer is that we can't just, because of the kinds of acculturations that occur, we can't just say this is a white problem, that there is some culpability uh, because people have adopted a kind of ideology, white, black, Latin, whomever in the room. And so being able to talk about a supremacist culture means that this is something that is pervasive, not just, not just about a single race um, uh, power structure, but a kind of power structure. Yes. Yes. Um, let's 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 delve that into that even more because I think that also when you're standing in a room with a bunch of people who black people are like I don't need this you know I couldn't possibly be racist you know so where do you see um, the 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 sort of um, responsibility even mm. for people who are in the room in terms of this notion of diversity and equity. Because I've heard black people say, I don't need diversity training. You know, yes. I live this, so I understand this, so I don't need diversity training, it's not for me. Um, can, we, can we talk a little bit about what that looks like? What does it look like when you're talking to a room full of black people about diversity even? And, or do you even get to do that? Yes, yes, beautiful question, and I do. Um, I've definitely been in scenarios. It hasn't been, I have not, I have yet to have in a room that is all black um, mm -hmm. to be able to have this conversation in. Um, we do not do trainings. The work that we do is we definitely stick to the language and language is a powerful thing. We stick to the language that this is a workshop and mm -hmm. the work has a capital W to it. And it's our responsibility as brown and black folks to understand Dr. Joy DeGruy's work, right? And when am I, my internalized racial oppression, when is that coming to play? When is that being upheld into the world that is around me? When am I actually upholding white supremacy culture without even knowing that I'm doing it because of the pervasiveness that we talked about before? <laughs> and so for me, I don't call it diversity training. I don't call it equity training. I do crafting your equity lens workshops. And so I help people understand when they don't see, when those blind spots are there, when we have that fixed mindset and we don't necessarily know what's outside of it until we get some more information of, inf of things that we didn't even know historically. Yes, we understand oppression. Yes, we've lived that in particular ways and it's been brought down upon us in particular ways, but we, we all have lived in different places as well. So it's different for all of us. And so I wanna honor and respect that too. And so I think it's our responsibility, even as black bodies, black bodied folks to ask ourselves, how much of my thinking is my thinking? Do I really feel this way about this? Or is this once again, supremacy culture telling me as a black man, as a gay black man, as a black woman, as a trans woman, as you know, that has black as part of that definition of how I'm defining myself, you are supposed to act this way. You are supposed to respond this way. And even if I disagree with it, I'm still fighting it to be able to make a decision or to be able to come into the room and have it there. I want seven generations from now to not have to go through all of that to be able to make the decision of whatever it might be in the room that they're in, that we don't have to go through this. And that when they look at the history lessons from this time, that they have a chuckle about it and are like, wow, I can't believe we used to treat each other that way. And that our humanity can be what goes first and foremost. And so I ask black and brown bodies, how much of your thinking is your thinking really? Or are we just, hustling at supremacy culture to win at it. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. So let's, let's talk about an equity lens then, 
What is that? Because that also seems to be now a term, you know? It's, we, we are always talking about the equity lens. We, we need to be acting and, and moving within this lens. What is it? Well, I don't know what equity lens you're talking about. And I've seen <laughs> some stuff because people have shown me things. Um, <laughs> But I landed on crafting your equity lens specifically um, about and around that question of how much of my thinking is my thinking. Uh -huh. And really looking at what I, what tools I got from various therapists that I have seen over the years, from the switch from white bodied therapist to finally a black bodied therapist and how that shifted a lot of it and really got me to look at it. And when I talk about equity, like I said before, Equity to me is humanity led. It's right. leading with the idea that I'm seeing somebody else's humanity first and foremost. So when I'm crafting, when you, I, I have my workshops of crafting your equity lens, I take people on a three day journey, you know, and they're going through a lot of introspection, self reflective um, work. They're looking at various things historically, they're looking at things currently. I and my facilitators are not telling them what they're supposed to be thinking or feeling. They're doing a lot of journaling. There's a lot of prompts to it. There's a whole front loading email that has all these self-paced modules to go through as well. Because as I stated before, this is intimate, personal work. If we want to say, oh, I'm putting my equity lens on. Oh, I see. No, everything is equal here. Everybody's on the same playing field. That's not it. It's like, oh, I've been upholding supremacy culture in this way, or I'm looking at the interconnectedness of myself. Oh, I'm looking at generational trauma. Oh, I'm looking at emotional intelligence. Oh, I'm asking myself, where is this coming from? What in my past can I be educated from? Not shame and guilt, not being stuck there, regretting and worrying and going over the same thing. But in, what can I learn from this? Oh, I don't see it quite yet. I haven't had that lived experience. I'm going to let it go and keep going because guess what? Those lessons always come back again. And so to me, in helping folks craft their personal equity lens, there is something about their own personal humanity being connected with others that comes to the surface. And it's not just about, oh, I'm rewriting my policies and procedures. I'm rewriting the mission statement because these things then inevitably tie back into my money, my productivity, my qualitative and quantitative information, my metrics that need to go into so-and-so to make it look like I'm doing a fabulous job at work. Mm -hmm. I don't subscribe to that. Yeah, yeah. And it, it strikes me too, as you're saying that, because in my brain right now, I, I'm thinking, wow, hard work, right? Mm -hmm. Lots of hard work. And I'm thinking that in Charlottesville, for instance, after 2017, that was the space that we all in some way entered. And five years later, um, there is a sense of a kind of fatigue around this cons, you know, this conversation around equity. Um, and so I guess my question is, what do you say when you are in the room and you're at that place where someone has expressed this notion of fatigue to you? You know, because I can tell you, um, I sit in rooms sometimes and I'm like, yes, yes. I'm so very tired of this particular conversation. Um, and there's a refusal. In my, I honestly am like, okay, I'm not joining this this little group over here. I'm gonna go get water till this is over, and I can come back and sit down and we can move on. So, how do you engage with with this notion of fatigue? Because I think people thought that DEI was going to fix a whole lot of things, mm. right? <laughs> and here we are. <laughs> so, you know. How, do you, how, does, how does that feel for you? And, and here we are really, Dr. Douglas, 45 years later, mm -hmm. not just five years later, but 45 years later. Mm -hmm. And I think that a lot of people really don't understand that. 
and how people really stepped into this work and it it got its name, you know, 40 plus years ago. And so the fatigue comes from the fact of that whiteness and the characteristics of whiteness, perfectionism, or that I'm going to see the results of this right now. Y'all, we got 400, 500, 600 years, years of this. And you think in five years, we're going to dissect and deal with and move everything on and it's all going to be roses and no, no, it, it is not. And that is the thing, being able to give myself grace and give others grace. And what we like to use is the phrase small bite sized chews, because that's what this needs to be. And for some people, because when we go out into the day, no matter what we've done, a lot of people are like, oh, that EDI stuff, I, I did that at work, right? It is everywhere. And that's the thing. If I don't, it's like, even now, us beautiful brown and black people, we got to put sunscreen on because of other things that we, <laughs> that's not this conversation. But it's like, we have to have that protective layer, right? Mm -hmm. So when we go out into the world thinking that we're all that in a bag of chips because I just did this EDI or implicit bias training or whatever kind of thing, we are being bombarded by 500, 600 years of other stuff that is constantly coming at us. That's where the real fatigue comes from is because the systems aren't changing. The culture is not changing. We keep saying, oh, this EDI initiative, oh, these words in our policy and procedure, oh, these words in our mission statement, oh, we're going to think our way out of it. It is the it is American with three K's culture. White supremacy culture is the culture of the United States. Every time I ask people, please tell me what the culture of the United States is. They everything that they say is no, nope, that's that's ethnic. That's that's from your German side, your Italian side, your your African side, your you know your Caribbean side. It's from those things. What's American culture, right? And mm -hmm. it always comes back to things that we can directly tie to supremacy culture, to white supremacy culture. So when we're being bombarded by that constantly, and we say, "Oh, I do the EDI stuff at work," or those of us who are like, "Oh, wait, this does mean something," and I'm not just doing it at work. I'm doing it all day and we start seeing how connected and interconnected all of it is. Hell yeah, we're tired. Mm -hmm. I mean, come on. And it's because there's not enough institutions. There's not enough folks out there that are looking at this from a cultural perspective and not just from this heady perspective that there's nothing wrong with America, that America is just fine. That it's like, no, we need to be looking at this in another way. And that's why people are fatiguing out. And so I tell people, small bite size choose. Look at your equity lens that you've crafted. Look at it every single day. Read it out loud. Read it before you send an email. Read it before you, you know, go home for Christmas or the other holidays or whatever's out there. Go for it before you step into this DEI meeting at work. If your work hasn't crafted an equity lens with us, it's like, yeah, because you, we have nothing otherwise in our day that helps us combat like that sunscreen against white supremacy culture as we are moving through the course of our day. We are being constantly bombarded with it. Mm -hmm. So the, this talk is called, entitled Blackface on, on White Power, right? And I think that begs the question about the the industry of EDI, yes. right? And the idea of who can be the EDI officer or who is responsible for the EDI space. So um, let's talk about that a little bit. Because yeah. I think that there, that this is also a very important point, right? So if, you, if your EDI officer is black, and you're in any space, whatever space it is, and that ADI officer comes in and says, I'm rubber stamping that and has taken on the responsibility of this corporate culture or whatever culture it is. Um, that's, a, that's a huge burden. That's a weight. All right? Yes. And then the flip side of that is, is it possible for an EDI person to be successful and be white and do this work? Mm, mm. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
And I'd really be interested in what you think about that. Yeah. If you're willing to sort of address it. I mean, because I think that is also important. This idea that the first, um, when EDI was rolled out, it became this place where you could find the diversity in the body that was in charge of it. And that diversity then gave a certain kind of cafe to institutions in terms of how they were engaging in that conversation. Right, right. It's I think we need to go back to, um, to Martin Luther King Jr., right? Mm -hmm. And we need to look at the ideas that um, Jason Reynolds brings up in Stamped that when he rewrote um, Ibram X. Kendi's book and he talks in the very beginning of the book, um, he has this, this couple of paragraphs where he's talking about the ideas of um, segregation, assimilation and anti-racism. And he gives kind of definitions for each of those. Mm -hmm. um, and he says, of course, you know, one word definitions they don't necessarily go too far, et cetera, et cetera. But that assimilation, that idea that if I dress a particular way, if I speak a particular way, when I'm stopped by the police, if I act a particular way, then I'm going to be fine. Mm -hmm. And we're not. And we know that we're not. And so in corporations, the flip of that happened. Oh, we have a lot of HR complaints about things that are race-based. Oh, well, let's appoint somebody here. And look, so now when some people come in and say those things, we, we just go, well, we've got this person here and now everything gets lumped on them. And so then all of a sudden this person of color is burning out and or they're shifting things and slowly doing things or talking about or upholding supremacy culture to psh, psh, relieve some of the pressure that's coming onto them from all these other situations. And that's that permeation that we talked about before and it being very pervasive and wiggling its way in there. And then just the ideas of internalized racial oppressions and looking at that fact. And a lot of folks want to say, well, you know, we don't need to go into those social movements and do that kind of stuff. If we get them where, where the dollars count, then they'll listen to us. Will they? Because when MLK did that, they killed him. So how are we really truly shifting a lot of these things? And I feel it's not until we actually look at ourselves and go, wow, I'm putting my black face on white power. And I call it that because that power is defined by the white male's imagination. Our entire country is based on the white male's imagination. Colonization is based on the white male's imagination. When do I get to imagine? Who's making me feel comfortable in the room? Because I'm always making everybody else feel comfortable with the gay black man in the room. Who's doing that for me? So maybe I need to not want a seat at your table, but I'm going to go over here and build a whole brand new table, a whole brand new seats, et cetera, et cetera, right? So that idea of can someone say that this is what it is, I think with a lot of the things that are out there, it's effective to the situation that you're in on certain aspects. And we're all at different places of our journey and of our feeling. People don't even think they need healing, right? So. We, we've got a question in the chat from John McLaren. Um, and the question is, I'm going to read the whole thing because I think we need the buildup. Thank you for this. In my academic department, we have trouble attracting minority students, a subject of ongoing frustration. We'd love to have a department that looks more like America. In your workshops, do you wheel, deal with that sort of issue? First of all, I'm not a fan of the word minority. I use marginalized instead kind of thing. Um, for me personally, that word is starting to be just as charged as the N word with the hard R. Um, that's myself. We would love to have a department that looks more like America. Well, where in America? Right? 
Where are we going? What are we, where are we looking? Because in America, there's still a lot of predominantly white institutions. There's still a lot of predominantly white neighborhoods. There's still a lot of predominantly white churches and synagogues, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So in our workshop, again, we are helping you craft your personal equity lens. You are the expert in your department. You are the expert in your higher ed institution that you work for. We are not there. We're not experiencing it. We haven't seen changeover of, you know, your president or the, the committee leader or whatever kind of stuff. So you have all that history. That's different than us just coming in and saying, well, this is how you solve it. This is what needs to go forward, et cetera, et cetera. What energy are you giving off? Because that's what I'm more about. If you're doing this personal intimate work, then there's a certain energy that you give off, I feel, and I've seen it, that changes the room, that changes the energy that this department gives off. Well, what, what magic do they have? What are they doing that's so differently? Well, maybe they're seeing other people's humanity first and foremost. They're asking people what they want. And because of the years that have passed, they are offering things that cover a broad spectrum of lived experiences. And that's why it looks so diverse because we are now giving off an energy that attracts so many diverse people. And right now, maybe because of that fixed mindset of supremacy culture, you really aren't doing that. No matter what poster you put up or words you put on that poster, your energy of your department is not that. I hope I answered your question. Well, I know, you know, in hearing that answer, I think that that, that it, there's been some clarity because, you know, this gives a little bit of sort of practical space to that because when we, you know, speaking from the point of view of the Heritage Center, for instance, the work that we're trying to do wants to lift up a narrative that has not been um, part of the majority culture, which is not to say that this narrative is a lost narrative, which is not to say that this narrative has never existed or any of those kinds of things. It is to say that there are people out there who did not know this narrative. And so we are bringing you all to this place where you can then engage with a better sort of sense of, 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 of knowing and, and therefore act from that sense of knowing, all right? So, and I think that along with all of that, we've also adopted a, a, a lot of, of, of language that I'm somewhat afraid over time may also be, um, I guess denatured is the word that I want. Things like authenticity. Right as a as a, a a language of the DEI space, we're all going to now be authentic, right? Mm -hmm. But what does that but what does that even really mean as we're thinking about that authenticity? Does that mean I get to be an asshole all the time because I'm authentically so, or does that mean, as you say, that we're going to engage in that very thing that makes us all human mm -hmm. and exactly. interact in that kind of way? And I think that. Asking ourselves that question, why am I an asshole all the time? Oh, wow. Because I subscribe to the ideology that success is this. The status quo told me that I need to get this and this and this, right? And I, no one gave me this, this, and this. And now I'm curmudgeon about it. And now I'm going to be an asshole to everybody. But it's like, wow, you based it off of somebody else telling you what success was instead of being truthful to what you see inside, right? And we've seen, you know, some of those things. Ferdinand the Bull comes to mind. I love I love that animation, right? And he wants to smell the flowers. He doesn't want to go out there and fight in a ring. He wants to smell the flowers. And it's not because he's just afraid of it. He's always loved the flowers kind of thing. And that's his authenticity. So when I look at us as humanity, it's like, well, wait, I'm always fighting and battling and striving to like be in the room and be who I am and so on and so forth. And it's like, well, I, if, what could I be if I didn't have to put energy towards any of that throughout the course of the day? 
any of us. If I didn't have to put so much energy into putting up some kind of front or asking constantly, can I fit in here? Can I be here? Can I be here? Can I do these things? If we stop putting energy towards that and really focused in on just putting energy out there that was on a different frequency. And here, if you've noticed, I've not told you what that frequency is because mm -hmm. I don't know what it is. I've never lived it. Mm -hmm. But I'll tell you, I am working hard that seven generations from now, they'll be able to say that they're living it. Mm -hmm. And that's the work that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. So as we're, as we're, you know, I'm inviting more questions, but I also am thinking, you know, this is, this question is about to um, <laughs> do just what we're saying we're not going to do. Cause it's about that question of how, where's the, what could you, offer leave us with that would help us as we begin this conversation because i believe that this is a great starting point and we have additional conversations to be had but if you what's your last word what is what is it that you, having come here and been here what is it that you would most want people to begin to think through as they embark in this conversation because i think we do need to unpack what's happening in these places of DEI all around. Um, I was sharing with you, I was invited to a meeting that was supposed to be a DEI meeting. And I thought to myself, has anybody read my resume? Why am I here? I am not an authority in this at all. So why am I here? And I, I have a feeling that I'm in, I was in that room because, you know, we're the black space. And therefore, we should know more than anybody else. But in reality, as you said, we have our own internal DEI work to do in the Heritage Center as we are attempting to do the research and, the, um, and, and, and drive policies in the way that we need to do it. We need to understand what it is that we're actually trying to do. So having said all of that, Beautiful. if you walked away from us tonight, what would you like to leave us with or when you do? I want to leave folks with words of the idea of grace. And some people are like, well, define grace for me. And I say, do your work because it's your work. You get to define it, right? Some people go to a faith-based definition of grace. Some people look in other places, but what does it mean to give yourself grace? And what does it mean to give somebody else grace? And of course, at the base root of all of this for me is to continuously throughout the course of the day, when I'm seeing someone and a narrative comes up and I'm thinking of them to be aware and be conscious of that and go, how much of my thinking is my thinking? I don't know that person. I've never met them but I have this idea of them. Oh, because that's the scientific way that the brain works. And then we, it's like, no, I think we've been fed that. I think our brains are, have the capacity for us to evolve beyond that and expand beyond that. So I invite people to have gratitude, have grace, and ask yourself continuously throughout the course of a day, how much of my thinking is really my thinking? And that's the thing that I think will get people started Small bite-sized chews, y'all. We, we, that idea that we got to fix it all right now and it's got to change right now and it's got to be these things right now. Remember, 400, 500, 600 years plus that we're dealing with. It's not going to happen overnight. And to be all right with that and to, to still be thankful and grateful for the things that we do see change and shift in our personal influence. If I throw a pebble in the pond, right? A pebble. But if I pick up a handful, throw a handful of pebbles, all those ripples, wow, now that's something. Well, I've learned a lot. Mm. I've learned certainly to sit and, and, and take a minute and slow down a little bit because these are heady ideas. One needs to, 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 to do the work that you're describing means that we also have to take that time in order to make those evaluations. And I think that's also 
a part of it. It can't be these hasty things, as, you, as you've said. So I do appreciate that that small bites uh, kind of, of idea. Matthew, thank you so very much for taking the time out to talk to us. I think everyone here um, has learned something just as I have. And this is a perfect way to start our journey into these conversations. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Douglas. And I look forward to being in your presence um, at, at any time in the future. Again, I, I too learned so much from being with you. And so you've helped me really think through some things as, as this has progressed as well. So thank you. Thank you. And thank you all for being with us. We appreciate it. Um, stay tuned for our next set of conversations. You know, we try through the Evelyn Barber's lecture series to address uh, issues that are important to Charlottesville, but also important to just our own humanity, as Matthew has, has, has offered for us. So thank you and have a good night.